Welcome to the Fun Facts of Mythology channel. King Solomon, the one who received wisdom from God, is known for the famous judgment of the two women and a baby. He is an intriguing character from the Bible, with stories that go beyond the holy book, such as the construction of the temple in Jerusalem and even the supposed invocation of 72 demons. But there's a reason he did it. Let's see what the Bible tells us about this demon summoning story, get ready to find out all that and more in this video. Please, if you are already subscribed, leave a like on the video and share it, especially for those people who have certain doubts about this story of Solomon and the demons. If you can help me even more, you can use the thanks button below, in the shape of a heart and donate any amount. And you who are not yet subscribed, watch the video, and if it is somehow relevant to you, leave your like too, thank you in advance. You know that we usually bring here on the channel stories that go beyond the Bible, such as the apocryphal books and even the Goetia, for example, which has the 72 demons of Solomon. As we intend to transform this theme into a channel series, thinking about it, we decided to make this video here explaining the whole story of Solomon and these demons that he would have invoked. And yes, there will be biblical passages here. But before that, let's talk a little bit about the Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as the Lemagitan Clavicle of Solomon. This book has several names, some claim that King Solomon himself would have written this book and others claim that someone else wrote it, but let's find out now. The Lesser Key of Solomon is generally categorized as a grimoire, but what exactly is a grimoire? A grimoire is a collection of medieval spells, this one in particular goes by many names, as I mentioned earlier, but perhaps the best known translation was by McGregor Mathers and Alistair Crowley, entitled, Goetia, The Lesser Key of Solomon. This book would have been inspired by several other mystical works, such as Kabbalah, for example, and contains information about symbols and how to invoke the famous 72 demons that would have been imprisoned by King Solomon. So that you can better understand the workings of this grimoire, Eliphaz Levi stated that those who possessed the clavicles of Solomon would not only be able to invoke and converse with spirits of all natures, but also to control their power. These collarbones, lost several times and then found again, are nothing more than the talismans of the 72 names and the mysteries of the 32 ways, hierographically reproduced in the tarot with the help of these signs and through their infinite combinations. Numbers and letters, it is possible to achieve, in fact, the natural and mathematical revelation of all the secrets of nature and to enter into communication with the entire hierarchy of intelligences and geniuses. After the book appeared in medieval times, its authorship remains unknown, and we will shortly touch on this subject. It was widely used by the Magi, at least in the first edition, as later there was a wave of manuscript forgery, and Solomon's clavicles was no different. From these collarbones, conjurations arose, and soon various other types of grimoires began to appear, such as the Grimorium Verum and the Grand Grimoire, which were often used to find hidden treasures. Solomon's grimoire had a powerful presence throughout the 16th century, containing figures and prayers that should be recited on the first seven days of the new moon, when the sun points in the morning. Those who practiced it would suddenly experience great knowledge. An example of the influence of this book at the time is highlighted by the historian Menendez y Palayo, in Spain. On this book, follows the opinion of the Most High Bishop of Segovia, Juan Batista Perez, in a memorable writing of 1595, the necromancers have a certain book of conjurations with unknown characters, which they call clavicula salomonis and which is prohibited in all the catalogues of the Inquisition. The magicians pretend that it was Solomon who wrote it in the Malleus Malficarum. The Inquisitor says that the necromancers use a book called Solomon, written in the Arabic language, and which was found by Vigilius in a prison in the Arabian mountains. I think you already have an idea of what this grimoire would be. But who would have actually written it? In fact, this book is classified as pseudographic, that is, a work with falsely attributed authorship. However, the issue is much more complex than that, according to legend, 
after Solomon received great wisdom from God, he would have acquired immense power over the world and used this wisdom to invoke and control demons, recording everything he learned. And transforming into the legendary clavicles of Solomon. However, the authorship of the book is quite ambiguous. Some claim that Solomon, the king of the Jews, wrote the work, while others argue that the true author was Solomon, the wise magician of Chaldea, and that there was confusion between the two. However, as I mentioned earlier, there are several editions of the grimoire, some making the difference and separation between these two characters called Solomon very clear, but most attribute the authorship of the book to King Solomon. The author of this book, using some scriptures from the Bible and the Talmud, a curious story emerges about King Solomon invoking demons, with some details very similar to those of the Gocha. The question that arises with all of this is, why would Solomon, a man endowed with all God-given wisdom, summon demons? If you think about it from the perspective that he would have invoked them for his own benefit, it really doesn't make sense. However, there is a story in the Talmud that would explain all of this. It would all start at a certain point in its history, when Solomon decides to build the Temple of Jerusalem, but he could not use any type of tool to cut the stones, as this would desecrate the soil and he had received direct orders from God not to do that. This information is mentioned in two passages of the Bible, in Exodus and in the first book of Kings. The Lord said to Moses, I say this to the Israelites, you have seen for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. Do not make idols of silver or gold to represent me. Make me an altar of earth and sacrifice your burnt offerings on it, your fellowship offerings, your flocks and your herds. Wherever I cause my name to be celebrated, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, do not make it with hewn stone, for the use with tools I would profane it. Do not go up by steps to my altar, lest your nakedness be exposed there. In building the temple, only blocks hewn and quarries were used, and no hammer or noise was heard in the temple, detailer, nor any other iron tool during its construction. But how would he cut the stones without the use of any tool? The answer can be found in the Talmud, where it is mentioned that Solomon consulted the sages on this matter. They mentioned a creature called a Shamir, which Moses used to cut the stones of the ephod, where various precious stones were placed. The requirement for the construction of the ephod was similar to that applied by Solomon in the construction of the temple. Solomon said to the wise men, How shall I make this stone be cut accurately, without using iron? They said to him, Like the creature called Shamir, who can cut stones, which Moses brought and used to cut the stones of the ephod. Dot. Shamir would be a type of beetle or insect, according to the Talmud itself, that fed on stones. Solomon would have used these insects to cut the stones of the temple, as they were capable of doing this in a straight line. Thus, it would be a perfect way to fulfill the rules established by God for the construction of the temple. However, another question arises, where would it be possible to find such a Shamir? It was at this point that the sages advised Solomon to summon two demons, one male and one female, and torment them until they revealed the location of this creature. Solomon summoned them, but they had no idea where the Shamir was. However, they mentioned that a high-ranking demon named Ashmedai might know. Solomon asked them, Where can I find Shamir? They replied to him, Bring a male and a female demon and torment them together. It is possible that, due to suffering, they will reveal a place for you. Solomon brought a male demon and a female demon and tormented them together. They said, We don't know where to find the Shamir. Perhaps Ashmedai, the king of demons, knows. Ashmedai seems like a rather peculiar name for a demon. However, he is said to be a well-known character in the hellish world. In fact, he is one of Asmodeus' many names. In that case, he would be the demon responsible for guarding the Shamir. Knowing this, King Solomon asked Benayahu, who was part of one of the most courageous and loyal groups of soldiers of the king, who in the Bible are known as Benayas, to imprison Ashmedai and force him to hand over the Shamir. Benaiah son of Jehoiada over the army and Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Benaiah climbed a tree with a chain and awaited the appearance of the king of demons. 
When he emerged, Benaya jumped on him and tied him up tightly. Ashmedai tried to free himself, but it was a difficult task, as the chain was engraved with the words of God. Benaya who came down from the tree, came and threw the chain around Ashmedai and included him within it. When Ashmedai woke up and struggled to remove the chain, Benaya who told him your master's name is upon you, the name of your master is upon you. Do not tear the chain, the name of God is written on this chain and it is forbidden to destroy it. According to the scriptures, when Ashmedai was captured by Solomon, the king actually avoided seeing him, and Ashmedai came to realize this. He always questioned the wise king. When Ashmedai arrived in Jerusalem, they did not immediately bring him before Solomon. Three days passed. On the first day he asked why the king did not wish to see him, and they replied that the king was drunk and overcome with drink. Ashmedai took a brick and placed it on top of another brick. The servants reported to Solomon what he had done. Solomon interpreted the action and said, This is what he told you by this illusion, return and give the king more to the drink. The next day, Ashmedai inquired why the king did not wish to see him, and they replied that the king was overindulging in food. Ashmedai picked up a brick and placed it on the ground. The servants came and told Solomon what Ashmedai had done. Solomon interpreted Ashmedai's actions and said, This is what he told you by this illusion, take away his food. At the end of the three days, Ashmedai finally appeared before Solomon. Ashmedai took a rod and measured four cubits, casting it before the king. He said to Solomon, See, when this man Solomon dies, he will have nothing in this world except the four cubits of his tomb. Now, You've conquered the whole world and you're still not satisfied unless you conquer me too. Asmodeus knew that the king wanted to obtain even more wisdom and he took advantage of this to try to use it against Solomon. Solomon said, I don't need anything from you. I want to build the temple and I need Shamir for that. Ashmedai said to him, the Shamir was not given to me, but was given to the angelic minister of the sea. He bestows it only on the wild cock, also known as the Dukafat or the Hupu, whom he entrusts by the strength of his oath to return it. After that, a conversation begins between Benaiah and the demon. Later, Benaiah said to Ashmedai, What is the reason why, when you saw that blind man lost on the road, you led him to the right path? The entity replied, They proclaim about him in heaven that he is a completely righteous man and anyone who does good for his soul will deserve to enter the world to come. Then Benaiah asked, And what is the reason that, when you saw the drunken man lost on the road, you led him to the right path? Ashmedai replied, That proclaims about him in heaven that he is a thoroughly wicked man. I have done good to his soul so that he may consume his reward in this world and have no reward in the world to come. Benaiah who continued and asked him, What is the reason you cried when you saw the joy of marriage? I knew that this man would die within thirty days, and the wife is obliged to wait for the Yavin, who is the underage husband's brother, until he reaches the age of thirteen, the majority, for him to be released through the ritual Halitza, by which the Yavin releases the Yavama from her Levirate bonds. Furthermore, he asked, What is the reason why you laughed when you saw that man ask the shoemaker to make shoes that would last seven years? Ashman I said to him, that man doesn't have seven days to live, he needs shoes that last seven years. Benaiah then asked, What is the reason why you laughed when you saw that sorcerer doing magic? Ashmedai replied, Because he was sitting in the king's treasury. Let me use your magic to know what is buried beneath him. These passages are a little interesting because, in a way, Asmodeus implies that he is somehow still answerable to God. After that, Solomon ended up giving in to the urge to learn more about the demon. Solomon kept Ashmedai with him until he completed the building of the temple. On a certain day he was left alone with Ashmedai and said to him, It is written for him like the lofty horns of the wild ox, and the sages say in the explanation of the verse like lofty horns. These are the ministering angels, the wild ox are the devils. In what way are you greater than us, since the verse praises your abilities and powers over human beings? Solomon would have read in the Torah about the evil powers of these spirits and was extremely curious. However, he understood that their power was part of the ministering forces, forces necessary to keep the world in balance between good and evil. 
he should never have learned more from one side than from the other, for without one, there would not be the other. The king had not paid much attention to that part and thus ended up being deceived by Asmodeus, who took his place on the throne. Ashmanai said to him, Take the chain engraved with the name of God upon me, and give me this ring with the name of God engraved on it, and I will show you all my strength. Solomon took off the chain and gave him the ring. Ashmedai swallowed the ring, grew until he had one wing in the sky and one on the earth. He threw Solomon the distance of four hundred parasangs. At that moment Solomon said, What is the benefit of a person with all his toil under the sun? With Solomon stripped of the throne, Ashmedai took his place. Solomon's chain and ring represented the Torah. When Asmodeus asked Solomon to get rid of them, he was actually asking him to abandon the Torah and embrace the way of nations. Thus, he would be given over to the understanding of the forces of evil. When Solomon left the Torah and threw the chain of Asmodeus away, the demon king took his place and ruled Israel for a while. Meanwhile, Solomon walked around as a poor and recognizable man. Time he wrote Ecclesiastes, as the following passage mentions. There was a small city where there were few men. A great king came against it, besieged it, and built great fortifications around it. But in that city there was a poor wise man who, through his wisdom, saved that city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. There is even a passage in the Targum which states that the man mentioned in Ecclesiastes is, in fact, Solomon. When King Solomon was on the throne of his kingdom, his heart was filled with pride for his riches and he transgressed the word of God. He accumulated many horses, chariots, and horsemen, and heaped up gold and silver he married foreign women. I bet the wrath of the Lord ignited against him. Then Ashmedai, the king of demons, was sent to cast him from the throne of his kingdom and take the ring from his hand. Solomon was condemned to wander the world, walking the city after city in the land of Israel, weeping and wailing, saying, I am Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, whose name was Solomon, the king of Israel in Jerusalem. In this begins Solomon's journey to prove that he was the rightful king of Israel. Regarding the verse, and this was my portion of all my work, Gemara asks what is the meaning of the expression and this. This expression is used as an allusion to the item that is actually in the hand or can be shown. Rav and Shmuel disagree on the meaning of this phrase. One of them said that it refers to Solomon's personal belongings that he held in his hand, and the other said that he is referring to his robe. Solomon went from door to door collecting charity, and wherever he came, he said, I, Ecclesiastes, have returned on Israel in Jerusalem. When he finally arrived at the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, the sages said, Now the fool does not hold on to a subject all the time. So what is this matter? Perhaps this man is telling the truth that he is Solomon. At one point everyone realized that whoever was on the throne was actually an imposter. The wise men said to Benayahu, Does the king demand your presence? Benayahu replied, No, they sent the queens and asked, does the king come to be with you? The queen sent an answer, yes, he comes. They sent a request to the queens to check his feet and see if they're human feet. The queen sent the answer to the sages that he has always been wearing socks and his feet cannot be seen. The queens continued to discuss the king's behavior, which required them to engage in sexual intercourse when they are menstruating, and also required that Bathsheba, his mother, have sex with him. When the Sanhedrin heard this, they realized that he was an imposter and not the real Solomon. They brought Solomon, gave him a ring and the chain on which the name of God was engraved. When Solomon entered, Asmodeus saw and fled. The Guemara adds that even so, although Asmodeus fled, Solomon feared for him. And as it is written, Behold the bed of Solomon, surrounded by sixty strong men, warriors of Israel, all of them holding swords and trained in war, each with his sword on his thigh, out of fear in the nights. Rav and Shmuel disagreed on this story of Solomon. One said he was a king and then became a commoner, and never returned to his position as king. The other said that he was a king who became a commoner and then a king, for he finally returned to the throne and defeated Asmodeus. As mentioned earlier, there is indeed a story about Solomon engaging with demons. However, why did I tell this whole story, 
if at no time Solomon invokes the demons of Goetia. Well, as mentioned, Asmodeus took Solomon's place for a while. This situation could explain some strange behavior of the king during his reign, including the possible invocation of the 72 demons. It is important to note that I used the term possible, not confirming in fact. Thus, who would have performed the invocation of the 72 demons of Goetia would be Asmodeus, not Solomon. If you have watched the video so far, please leave yours to show that you liked, and also sign up not to miss any content. See you soon.